there are a lot of people who make their own gods or who want to make their own gods. And so you have your Greek mythology. They're gods up on Mount Olympus and intertwining in the affairs of man, taking advantage of their greater powers over mortals. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trust in them. This a truism. If your God is a false God, you are becoming false. Because a man becomes like his God. The Bible tells us, beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doesn't yet appear what we're going to be, but we know that when he appears, we're going to be like him. You're either created by God and recognize that, or you're trying to create your own God. This is uh, what we call the Parthenon. On the outside, it's a neat looking structure, and of course, it's uh, tied to Greek gods. As you can see them right there, is your, uh, it's all your Greek gods. And on the, on the outside, you know, just like a building, and like that, there's your Greek gods and there's the Greek war, it is the Parthenon. But you go inside here, and, and when you go up under the building and you uh, uh, go deep inside here, this is what's uh, residing in Nashville and up under this building that you wouldn't think is there. Look how huge that is. Look how huge this thing is. And it's draped in gold idol gods to fallen angels. That's all it is. We're here at the Parthenon in Nashville, Tennessee. The goddess Athena. She is huge. There's a snake. And on her right hand is Nike. He has a snake around her wrist and there's a snake down at her foot, a big one, and then there's a shield. And the shield on that side shows the fighting between the Giants and the Olympians. I'm making a video. Look uh, here, y'all. What, what is this? This means something right here. What is this? Wow. This is crazy. This is demonic. Were the Greek gods real? In the ancient epics uh, and myths, the gods show up all the time. They're an essential part of the myths. There's a grain of truth behind all the myths and legends. Something causes them to arise. In the scripture, uh, we see that all human beings have come from a common ancestor, not just Adam, but filtered down through Noah and his three sons. If we think about what uh, the generations after Noah and his three sons would have been doing, they would be passing on the knowledge that they have, and it would be especially motivated by the fact that the earth has been destroyed, and they are the only people, and they need to tell their children what the earth has been. Um, it's inconceivable that they would have passed on knowledge about the past without talking about having walked with God in the garden, about having been given information that we can never receive. Um, about knowing the uh, sons of God uh, fell in love with and intermarried the daughters of men and produced a race of giants. That's an account of angels uh, mixing up with uh, human beings. Um, instead of saying that um, uh, paganism is entirely false and it needs to be entirely rejected, as though there's no value in it at all, we need to think rather that pagans were not the first people on the earth. That's what an evolutionist would tell us. It was uh, believers in God who were the first people on the earth. Pagans came along and rejected the truth. But they didn't reject it by throwing it away entirely, they just warp it and distort it so that they can live with it. 
most fascinating places in Petra. It's this obelisk that they actually carved this. They didn't come up here and set it up or drag it up here and set it upright. They carved away all the mountain that was around it. As I turn the camera around, you're gonna see behind me the slab of stone. And if you look carefully at the slab of stone, you can see crisscross hatch marks all over it. This is where they took their iron tools and hammered away the mountain in order to expose this particular obelisk that they used in their pagan worship. There's even another one behind it, as you can see in the background. Yeah, they borrowed it from the Egyptians, and these people weren't Egyptians, they were Nabataeans. That means that they were descendants of Esau, who were constantly at war with Jacob, the twin brother of Esau, who became Israel. And Israel, the land, is named after him. But this is a pagan high place here in Petra, and I just wanted to show you how they did it. They carved everything away. If you look even further behind me, you can see this high place, the structures behind me, but below it, you see those walls down there? They're all carved out. People just took chisels and they hammered it away until they had the shape that they wanted. These people knew about hard work. And they did it for pagan gods. Hmm. Well, they tried to obtain their salvation by how well they did, by what they were able to do to impress their gods and maybe even man. Construction is well underway at the Pyramid in downtown Memphis to turn the former Tomb of Doom into one of the largest Bass Pro shops in the country. Construction is well underway to turn this facility into a Bass Pro megastore. Once branded the Tomb of Doom, home court for the University of Memphis Tiger basketball team, the aluminum-skinned Great American Pyramid Arena also served as the place to go in the Mid-South for concerts, monster trucks, rodeos, even National Promise Keeper religious gatherings. Now, thanks to radio talk show conspiracy theorist Alex Jones, the empty arena is again in the national spotlight as a cornerstone against the occult. And you can see the Memphis Pyramid built back in the early 1990s by John and Isaac Tigran. And uh, these guys are admittedly into the occult. You can just look up their names. They're all over the local newspapers. A crystal skull was discovered and subsequently removed from the tip top of the pyramid about a month after it opened in November 1991. No one would go there anymore because of deaths and flooding and electrical problems and everything else you can imagine. The Devil Palace stayed in use throughout most of 2005, but was used less and less after FedEx Forum opened in 2004. Memphis leaders, of course, hope the pyramid doesn't fall, that it instead rises as a beacon for outdoor enthusiasts and good family fun when Bass Pro sets up shop, this time without a crystal skull at the top. Hey, you gotta put it, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we've arrived deep in the caves and we had to crawl through a small hole, but this is what you find throughout all of these caves here in, uh, in Potosi, is you find uh, these, uh, the rooms of the of the devil god uh, Tio, and then he's worshipped in here. And outside, um, it's uh, heavily Catholic, and then they worship uh, they worship Jesus outside and Mary and, and all the rest. But uh, but it's like deep in the caves here, and uh, and we've been walking for quite some time now. But uh, you can go like three, four kilometers in here, and then you come across certain rooms like this, and then other places. You know, the miners are working and uh, and just hoping to to strike a silver vein. Hundreds packed St. Leonard's Church in Boston's North End. Hundreds more waited patiently outside. I've just said to my husband, this is a once in a lifetime, we need to do this. These Catholic faithful came to venerate, to pray to a saintly relic. In this glass box is the heart of St. Padre Pio, a 20th century saint known for his piety and prayer. His life also characterized by the sacrament of reconciliation. He spent 10 to 15 hours a day in the confessional. He heard something like five million confessions through the course of his life. Um, he went out and he healed the world. He forgave the world. It's the first time this relic has traveled beyond Italy. And this saintly encounter with Padre Pio is a chance to touch this man of God, who was so connected to Jesus, he bore the stigmata, the painful wounds of Christ on the cross. Padre Pio, for me, is a uh, strength because he spent many, many, many years going through the passion of Christ, not being believed that he was 
close to God. Emotions ran high, hearts were full. We've been traveling to Italy since 1973, and I'm going to visit him every time. So, so, so what do we see here? You have to see that before Buddhism, right? Before Buddha existed, we have all this God, right? From Hindu, mm -hmm. all right? So we have Knet, we have Nalai, uh, Lakshmi. So these all sound like Hindu gods. Yes. Right. Hindu gods. Ah. So why do you actually have them in your in your room then? Because I want to show everyone that we have this. And then Buddha time, and then by the time that he's gone. Ah, okay. So you have, so it's kind of like a timeline. So before Buddha was born, you had all of these gods, and then Buddha was born, and there's the child Buddha. What do you do? Like, if you want to pray to one of these these statues, what what do you actually do? Do you have to? I ask. For, just stand there and ask for what you want. Depending on what you want from each person, there's not everything that you can ask for. For example, if you want to be rich, you want to be. Um, no, not rich. Uh, like when I say rich, it means you're rich everywhere. I mean, rich for food, rich for people who love you, rich for money. So anything that anything. you would possibly want in life. So I was born to a Hindu family in the eastern part of India, in the middle of nowhere, we say a rustic and rural village. We used to worship a lot of gods and goddesses. My father was a clan priest. So, after him, the, the evil spirit chose me to be the next priest for the clan, so I was under training. And so, we used to worship, even I, in the process of learning to be a priest, went through lots of mantras and slokas and by all those, you know, chantings. It was during this time, something bad happened. My father's worship was not accepted, accepted by the spirit. So it started to attack my whole family. It was just mad. And it was during this time, my father and uncles went everywhere finding somebody who would help us to get rid of this spirit and they found none everybody that came and chanted mantras nothing happened you know they brought in all these witch doctors sorcerers black magicians and everybody would come and chant mantras and go back and the spirit would not buzz everybody in the family was sick and the spirit would come on somebody and would openly through, you know, threaten and say, I would kill all of you, literally. Two, two of my aunts went insane. They would say, hey, we're the gods, worship us, we'll give you wealth. And the whole village would come and worship this insane woman. Even my mother became very sick. And one evening, uh, my mother was laying on her sick cot right in front of my eyes my mother passed out i shook her body i screamed i shouted mommy mommy and she would not really wake up and in those days we had no doctors we had no hospitals and so we called the village heads soon the whole village gathered there and the village head um declared her dead and that was in the evening I called my guru who was helping me to learn mantras. He came and chanted a lot of mantras. Nothing happened. We gave up hope and we were waiting uh, uh, for the morning so that we could take her to the crematorium. As these ladies were doing, there was a lady among this group who had been to a town near Ra Raipur, the city that we landed in, and into a steel factory. And there, somehow, she was introduced to Jesus. So she had come back as a believer, but nobody knew that she was a believer. She said, hey, this seems to be the attack of the evil spirit. And if you want, I'll pray for her, and she will rise up. This lady stoops down, touches my mother's shoulder, makes a very simple prayer, and just gets up. Right after she gets up, my mother shakes her body, 
sneezes and coughs and sits down. She was surprised that she was in the death bed. She jumps out of that bed and everybody around her thinks that it was a ghost attacking them so they all run away from there. But finally we know that it was my mother and not the ghost. And so everybody was so happy. As a growing young man already into chanting of mantras, I thought she might have chanted a powerful mantra. In the evening I went to her house and I said, Ma'am, you have a powerful mantra. Can you teach that mantra to me? And this lady says, I, I didn't chant any mantra. I prayed to Jesus. I said, well, who this Jesus is? Tell me all about him. So I would sit down with her, and since she didn't read any Bible, she would just take bits and pieces of Bible story that she could remember and would narrate it to me. And every time she would speak from the stories of Jesus, you know, I would get goosebumps and something unusual would happen to me. A kind of peace and serenity would just set in. One evening, I was by her doorstep, she runs from, runs coming to see me from her room. She says, hey, have you come with some question today? I say, yep. Yeah. She runs back to her room, brings a piece of paper, throws it in my hands and says, go to this place. They would have answers to all your questions. So I take this piece of paper and that turns out to be a place in Delhi which was almost two hours of bicycle ride on a mountain trail, or just a trail in wooded areas. I took two hours of uh, bicycle ride, six hours of bus ride to a railway road, and uh, 28 hours of train ride to wow. a place called New Delhi. I got there, and how I got there was a miracle. That turned out to be a Bible college. But I stayed there. I'd go to the roof and I would just cry and weep and say, Lord, I came to know you. I did not come here to study in a college. Please help me. Walking back to my dorm, I spoke to the Lord and I said, Lord, please help me to understand this language. I would never, ever speak a single word in any other language until I learned a little bit of English. So I took an English Bible and a Hindi Bible, put together, and I would stare at those sentences. Within six months, something very miraculous happened. Those sentences that I'd stare out at would stare out at me, and I would understand them very well. Those words became so obvious, the grammatical structures became so obvious, the syntax was so clear for me. And so within six months, I became the official translator. Um, meanwhile, there was a man who really loved me so much, one of the professors, and he would t teach me about Jesus. He was the one to lead me to Christ. I repented from my sins. I accepted Jesus. And I think it was around the seventh or eighth month of my stay in the Bible College. And then I decided to uh, take baptism. And I became so strong believer in him and nothing and I, I would tell you those were the golden days of my life where I would spend hours together just sitting in the presence of God and thanking him for what he did for me and every day that I would read the word as though the words were just staring at me screaming out and telling me something important that I never knew about God.